Hello, graduate students. My name is Oksana Moroz, and I am a social media member at large for Graduate Student Council, American Association for Applied Linguistics. Today, I'm here with Dr. Mary Stewart. She's the Associate Professor of Literature and Writing Studies, General Education Writing Coordina Coordinator at California State University, San Marcos. Hi, Dr. Stewart. Welcome to our Graduate Student Council YouTube channel. And I would like to first ask you to introduce yourself and maybe tell us a little bit more about your scholarship. Sure. Thanks, Oksana. I'm so happy to be here and to get to um, sort of virtually chat with all of you. Um, so uh, as Oksana said, I'm, uh, I'm uh, an associate professor at uh, Cal State San Marcos, um, and my scholarship is in online learning and composition studies. So I kind of fall into the online writing instruction community. Um, I've been studying online learning for a long time. I actually started my career as a um, before I went back to get my PhD uh, teaching online and working as an instructional designer as a for-profit uh, educational institution um, in like 2007. So I've been online for a long time. Um, and this last year has been interesting to watch the rest of the world um, experience not what my world has been with online learning, but but sort of start dipping into uh, online education. Yeah. Thank you. So definitely, since your scholarship is focused on online learning, I have a first question that goes along with that. So how to maximize the effectiveness of online instruction in a language and writing context? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that um, I love so much about teaching writing online, and I've been, I mostly kind of teach first year writing courses, um, and my preferred mode is to teach them in an online space. And, and it's because it's already a textual environment. So I think there's a lot of opportunities in our writing and language courses to really draw students' attention to the types of writing that they're doing in an online class, right? So you're writing discussion forums, weekly reflections, your actual major assignments, uh, and a lot of uh, online courses, you're also having like video calls and having to communicate multimodally, right? Um, so I think there's a big opportunity to really ask our students to analyze their own experiences as students who are writing and composing uh, in the space of the course. And so I think it creates this kind of cool meta experience um, that really can can enhance their learning of the course material. Um, at the same time, I would also say if you're going to really enhance online learning, uh, trim it down, right? Like it's a lot for students to encounter. And so the other thing I like about teaching writing online is that I can kind of, I really try to trim down and my assignments and have like do more reflection, more kind of of them just being in the space and thinking about how they're writing in the space and less like reading kind of, uh, you know, other sort of outside materials. That's great. And, you know, um, going off that, since our world as of last year was pandemic pedagogy and, you know, who knows, going back to fall 2021, um, how do we succeed instructing in a hybrid class? Mm -hmm. Something that it might be a little bit more challenging as compared to just online or face to face, but more of a hybrid mode. Yeah, definitely. I think that's such a great question. And it's so interesting. Right now in my professional community and in the online writing instruction world, we're having a lot of conversations about terminology. Um, because it, it used to be that like, we kind of had a, a sense of what was hybrid and what was online and what was face to face. And those lines are getting incredibly blurred. Um, so like right now at my institution, we define hybrid as like either 50 or 75 minutes of physical in-class time and then asynchronous online activities that go with that. Um, but there are a lot of different versions that might be at your university. Some people might think of a hybrid course as something that has like 50 or 75 minutes of synchronous video chat and then asynchronous online activities. Or hybrid could be something where like you have a face-to-face -face meeting, a physical face-to-face -face meeting, and then a synchronous video chat meeting and then asynchronous, right? So I think the first step to succeeding in hybrid instruction is getting a clear sense of what your modality actually is, right? Um, and then I think it's a matter of really uh, leveraging what what you do have. <laughs> so um, my friend and colleague, Lyra Hillard, um, always really advocates for something called the castle top model, which I think is pretty cool. And what it does is it, it kind of goes like this, right? Uh, and you're, we're thinking about the difference between how like asynchronous, like synchronous activities inform asynchronous activities, which then inform synchronous activities, which then inform asynchronous activities, right? Um, so when you're thinking about your modality, I think the first thing is like, how much asynchronous class time do I have? How much synchronous class time do I have? What's the order of these things, right? And then how do I think about blending them into each other? So 
for example, like I'm teaching an online course right now that is has two video meetings a week and then has asynchronous in between them. And so like I have my writing students like do a discussion forum asynchronously online, which I then read and use to create like a little presentation in the synchronous class where I'm like, this is what you guys said on the forums. It was really interesting. And then in the synchronous class, we then like go into an activity where like we've been doing a lot of like reading circles where that we read like a paragraph that they're then going to go home and finish reading during their asynchronous time. Right. So it's a matter of like, how do you how do you think about how these different modalities fit together and really take advantage of the fact that like asynchronous time is really good for reading and reflection and, um, you know, that sort of thing. And synchronous time is really good for like interaction and discussion and that sort of thing. Right. So how do we use both of those types of learning um, to where they're kind of um, really complementing each other, right? Um, as opposed to being, as you kind of said, like two separate things. Yeah, Th those were very great um, advice. Um, and you know, the third question I have is actually what aspects of digital learning during pandemic period worked and should be implemented in face-to-face -face classes? I think this is probably the most important since, you know, the world last year, we kind of experienced um, everything that <laughs> um, we were not ready for. And um, there are definitely some things that um, we should probably keep and maybe even expand on when we hopefully go back face to face or, you know, if some schools decided to go to a hybrid uh, mode. So what do you think were those successful um, aspects of digital learning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so great. And I love that you're asking this question because there is a difference between online learning as it was pre-pandemic and what a lot of people are calling emerg emergency remote instruction that we were all dealing with. And then you have whatever post-pandemic online learning is going to look like. And I think this is really important because like, pre and, and a lot of the scholarship on online learning is all about pre-pandemic, right? So it's not always applicable, right? Um, so I think one thing is like, it's like in a, in a pre-pandemic space, online learning was really defined as like a cohorted model, a group of students who were like working through, as opposed to like correspondence learning or distance education. So like there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of classify that, right? What happened in emergency remote instruction, which I think was so unique, was that especially last spring, everybody had a course design that they then had to revise mid mid go. Hopefully that will not happen to us again, right? Um, <laughs> but so there's one thing about so one thing that like emergency remote instruction, what was unique about that um, was the fact that our our intended instructional design was very much disrupted. And that kind of gets into the 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 planning phases of a course to where you're not able to, you know, um, um, envision a course from the beginning, which is also really important in online learning is having a, a, like a clear plan from the start. Um, because of that disruption, I think what was unique about the pandemic period um, was the like compassionate pedagogy became absolutely necessary for everyone. Um, issues of access became very, very blatant, right? Um, and I think that what is, you know, I, I don't, I, we all, we always have had issues of access. We have always needed to be more compassionate in our education. But I think the pandemic made this such a such a dominant part of the conversation um, that my hope is that that's the thing that we will really continue to implement and think about how do I create flexible and inclusive and accessible classrooms that are not just technologically accessible, um, but that are also accessible by thinking about my students like are humans who are struggling through a ton of complicated things in order just to arrive at my class, whether that arrival is arriving on video chat or arriving in the physical classroom or signing on to the discussion forum. And I think the more that we can really um, hold on to that and remember that in all of our pedagogies, um, I think that's just going to be really important moving forward. Yes, definitely. And my last question is, what do you think students should be prepared for um, for fall 2021, both as, you know, graduate students taking courses, maybe undergrads, and then um, at the same time, some of those graduate students might be working as teaching associates or teaching assistants or graduate assistants, um, instructing courses or assisting somebody. Um, what kind of advice would you give them for the fall 2021 semester? Yeah. Um, gosh, what should you expect? What's so hard about right now about everything about our lives is that everything is unexpected and uncertain. And that's so hard because, because I mean, and I'm thinking about this as I'm looking to fall too, what is fall going to look like? Like I'm designing my courses as a, as hybrid courses to the best of my ability. I'm trying to set them up to where they're going to be, you know, flexible and responsive to my students. Um, but I also 
more so than ever before, I'm not entirely sure what my student population is going to be like, um, because there are still so many questions, even like I have a face to face component, but we're still figuring out like, are we masked? Are we not? What does that mm -hmm. look like? You know, what are the logistics of that if we are? Um, so I think there's just a lot of questions still. And I think that's what makes it so important to really ground ourselves in this idea of this like accessible and flexible uh, and, and flexible pedagogies. And the good thing about online learning is that it's always been pretty good at that. Like online learning from the beginning was always designed for non-traditional students who for any number of reasons couldn't couldn't come to a brick and mortar campus and attend college in like the quote unquote normal way. And so a lot of online pedagogy is about doing a lot of pre-planning, having a lot of a design up front, knowing what the arc of your course is like, knowing what you're um, having very carefully scaffolded assignments so that your students can like follow you through there, even though their, you know, their interactions with you are mediated and therefore more complicated. So being like super clear and super explicit is really important in the online space. Um, and then I think just intentionally designing for adaptation. Um, so doing things like surveying your students before the semester starts to figure out where you guys at, you know, like if we're on video chats, are you in a space to where you're going to be able to turn it on? If if you can't have your video on, how do I adjust my pedagogy to make sure that you've got lots of ways to like type in or something like that, right? Um, and then doing a lot of like weekly reflections that ask students straight up like, how's it going? You know, like, what, what what was the workload like for you? Like, did you have any problems with, you know, accessing any of the activities? So just really genuinely soliciting a lot of feedback from your students and then being willing to make adjustments um, and kind of designing your course from the start to where it can be adjusted and tweaked a little bit, right? Um, yeah. That would be my advice for teachers, for graduate students who are both students and teachers. First of all, you are heroes and amazing humans for managing uh, all of that work and, and putting on all those different hats. Um, I think as a student, my advice would be to, you know, create a weekly to-do list, um, set aside specific time in your day to take your classes and to do your teaching, um, try to kind of, you know, the, the problem with uncertain times and with online learning is that time gets to be a very weird construct, right? And so I think kind of creating your own structure in your week and in your day that makes sense for you um, so that you can kind of impose on yourself that sort of structure that we lose when we're not like physically required to be someplace at a specific time, you know? Yeah, that's great. And I'm so happy that we got to talk about those important things. Definitely moving forward to the fall semester, I think it will be very helpful for students to watch this. So I want to thank you, Dr. Stewart, for your time and input. Um, to all the graduate students, please stay tuned for our next guest speaker and subscribe to your channel. Bye. Bye.